Cool. All right. Hi. Looks like we're live streaming. So hi, everyone. I'm Joaquin Beltran. I'm the creator of Speak Up America. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Jeremy Camille, an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Louisiana State University. Uh, he's been working on the pandemic for the last year uh, and is working on sequencing the virus. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours and I, you're one of my favorite follows on Twitter. Uh, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's really a privilege to be in front of a different audience uh, than you know, just a bunch of science geeks. So uh, it's always nice when you're a scientist to cross over and have something you're working on be of more general interest. Most yeah. of us are very specialized, so it's it's a unique moment. Just put the, put it put it lightly. Well, th thanks so much for being here. Uh, you know, we want the purpose of, of this talk to help inform uh, you know everyday people and provide an update on, on variants and vaccines uh, to help empower them to keep themselves and their communities and their families safe. Um, so um, we'll take it back to, you know, a, a little bit on, on just the, um, you know, talking about transmission of the virus, and then we'll go into into variants and then vaccines, and then and then we'll close it out at the end. Um, but just on on the basics of transmission of the, of the virus, right? What's the primary way the virus spreads and, and precautions people can take to avoid spread of the virus? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because even it's kind of funny because we're like over a year into the pandemic and it seems there's still even confusion at the highest levels of government and how to like do appropriate public health messaging about how the virus transmits. Because you still hear, uh, you know, people talking about washing hands more often. And I mean, that's fine. It's a good idea always to wash your hands for a whole bunch of reasons. But the number one way that this virus seems to like to transmit is respiratory route. So uh, I'm not going to say that it never transmits other ways or that washing hands won't prevent you from catching coronavirus, but the way the most likely like 999 out of a thousand times you're going to catch coronavirus disease is by sharing an indoor space that's poorly ventilated with someone who's in the, what we call the pre-symptomatic stage of transmission. What makes this virus like so stealthy and how it caused a pandemic um, is that people are most infectious for a two day period before they even feel sick. So um, if you're like, they hop on a plane, they feel fine. They're having a nice chat with the person next to them about the latest you know, football game or basketball game or some cool video they saw and yada, 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 talking about their kids. All the while little droplets are coming out of their mouth. And if it's a clo enclosed um, small space with poor ventilation, what will happen is the virus can get into someone's nose or mouth from that person near them and they can get infected. And that's why masks are so important because as we speak, even though we don't think about it, there's like little tiny things that leave our mouth that are little, we call them respiratory droplets. Uh, like me right now, luckily we're protected by Zoom. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if, you, if we were in the same room, you'd be, being, you'd be getting bombarded by a sample of all the things that are incubating in all the trillions of cells in my upper respiratory tract. And right. usually if you're not sick, there's nothing to be afraid of, but with uh, a disease like COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, it is something that we have to worry about. Uh, and this virus spreads most, we know the data says clearly it spreads most effectively indoors, poorly ventilated. So when I see people wearing masks outside, I'm all for that. If it's a highly dense urban area, I'm not like gonna tell anyone who's high risk not to wear a mask and play it safe. But if you really look at the numbers and the contact tracing results, it says people who got infected at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, I'm not going to get into variants yet. We can talk about that right. later. Right. But people in the beginning of the pandemic with the OG virus from, you know, 2019, December, Wuhan, China, that those people got infected because they spent 10 to 15 minutes or longer in an enclosed indoor, poorly ventilated space with someone else who later turned out to test positive. That's how almost all the transmission occurred. So you saw at the beginning of the pandemic, they closed down playgrounds. They, you know, they, it was like a zombie movie. And right. for good reason, we, we didn't know what was happening. We didn't have the data yet, but now the right. data is in, it's really clear that this virus really transmits indoors, poorly ventilated spaces. So if you are going to choose when to wear a mask, right. well, the silly thing you hear is like someone 
walks all the way to a bar or a restaurant wearing a mask outdoors, driving in their car alone, wearing a mask. Right, they right, right. To a bar, they take off their mask, they're drinking a beer, eating a hamburger, talking to a person next to them. That you just basically, that's called penny wise, pound foolish. Right. You, you wore the mask all the times you didn't need to, and you took it off the time you did. I mean, I would still recommend if you haven't gotten a vaccine, do not be dining indoors at a restaurant. Do not go to a karaoke bar. Do not attend a theater event. Do not go to your church choir unless it's like a virtual one. After you got two doses of the vaccine, different story. Right. I mean, that, that's such a great point, you know, because people are told to wear a mask, but the, it's not communicated the context of when to use a mask, right? Yep. Or, or, or the reason for wearing a mask, right? Yep. It, like, like you said, it's this, um, this sharing of the air, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Indoor spaces. Air. Um, and so, you know, um, yeah, you know, if, if you're indoors, you know, uh, and, and so like, you're talking about mass. Um, we haven't had a discussion, uh, at least a large discussion on the quality of mask, right? I, 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 it's a little bit, but, but you know, um, th does that matter, right? Um, and, and maybe we could go into variants after that too, right? Yeah, I think the quality of the mask does matter, but I think for your average, like Joe, like even myself, I don't have a KN95. Like I managed to avoid getting infected the whole time, went shopping and Louisiana had it bad. I mean, we got slammed mm -hmm. and I was really worried about getting sick myself. I just wore cloth masks. And I think that even the basic like, you know, entry level cloth mask that goes over your face will do the trick. You should the mask that's, it's like, I think it's like the same motto as a camera. The best camera you have is the one that's in your pocket or the one you have with you. Right, right. The mask that is comfortable for you to wear all the time without having to feel like you have to take it off uh, indoors if you're mixing right. with other people indoors is right. a mask you want to wear. Um, if you are high risk, then I think you may want to consider upgrading to a KN95. And that's the kind of mask that a healthcare worker who's taking test samples from someone who they know is positive or very likely to be positive. Like if I'm a physician, which I'm not, I'm a PhD, so don't take any of this as medical advice. But if I'm a physician taking samples in a nursing home where there's an active outbreak or a prison or some you know, crowded indoor community where people are you know, vulnerable and 50% of them we know are already infected and we're trying to test everyone. I know when I'm swabbing people, there's a 50-50 chance that that person is exhaling coronavirus on me. I want to be wearing a KN95. And I have a colleague named right. John Van Cherry who does all the event vaccinating in our area. And he has teams of nurse practitioners, medical students, people working with him to vaccinate and to test. And when they go into a hot zone, they're wearing KN95 or N95 masks. And they've never, like John has had a, a nursing home resident who tested positive cough on him wearing that KN95 yeah. mask. He had to isolate. He did not test positive after because oh. the masks actually work. So yeah, it's one amazing. thing to wear, a, there's two, the, for your audience, I would say there's, there's two things to know. There are masks that prevent you from being a risk to others. And that's the thing that if you're like in your twenties, thirties, you know, most of the risk of death is in older segments. I don't want to say there's zero risk to younger because even children on rare occasions can get really sick from COVID and have long COVID. So I don't want to trivialize, trivialize that at all. But at the same time, statistically speaking, you're in your 20s and 30s, like you're, the biggest risk is that you're gonna silently spread the virus to someone who's vulnerable, okay? So all you need to do is wear a cloth mask that prevents those little droplets I was talking about from getting out the way that they normally would. Now to protect yourself, if you're high risk, like diabetic, really overweight or high blood pressure, if you received an organ transplant. I mean, there are people, there's enough people out here, there who are high risk, have some immune dysfunction or that are just really scared and that's their decision. They might wanna to choose to wear a better mask, like a KN95 or an N95, which is the same type of mask that a doctor would use to protect themselves from a patient they know has coronavirus. So those are just two different things and we have to separate them and know the difference. And right. when do you need to wear those masks? When you're up in someone's face, when you're mixing indoors in a crowded environment, or if it's a hyper urban environment like New York City, where you have skyscrapers. I mean, like, I think the bets go off on like how the virus might transmit outdoors in a super densely populated area. Right. Or if you're in like a 
an auditorium at like a sporting event with 30 or 40,000 other people, even though you're outdoors and there's good ventilation, hey, there's so many people breathing in that small space. Oh, and, and shouting. Outdoor. Yeah, right. and shouting that's and screaming. Right. Bingo. Yeah. So that's where I, I don't like to be black and white about what's indoor versus outdoor. You have to right. think about how many people are close together and might overcome some of those ventilation issues. Yeah, uh, that's great clarification. Um, and so uh, now, so, you know, we've, 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 it's been a year about, right? A little over a year with the virus. Um, and now, um, you know, over the last few months, uh, we've had the introduction of, of variants of concern, right? Var variants happen, you know, mutations happen. But um, if, if you can share, you know, what is a variant, right? Um, and also, you know, um, what are the existing variants of concern? Well, as far as I know, there's three, uh, the, the, the tricky thing about, let's start with variants, okay? Yeah. Uh, because one thing is a biological definition, the other is a regulatory definition. And sometimes those line up one-to-one -one, and other times, you know, the science is always ahead of the government recognizing the science. That's just inevitable. So. What is a variant? A variant is just like a cousin. Like your cousin doesn't have your name or social security number, but they may have a lot of your genes, right? They don't look like someone from a different continent who's not in your family tree at all. They're your cousin, they're your blood. Viruses have brothers and sisters and cousins just like we do. And a variant just means a unique individual that has a constellation of differences across the genome that make them your family or your cousin or your little piece of the family tree. So a variant is nothing special at all. It just means, hey, as we're tracking the family tree, what, I, what I kind of tripped me out about the whole pandemic is realizing from all the sequencing that every time there's been a plague or a black death from the middle ages, you know, yeah. when you, like when you read about that in a biology textbook or a history book or a sociology book, you think about like, oh, wow, the black death or like medieval times, like, you think of like Yersinia pestis, the plague, you think of one bacteria, or you think mm -hmm. about like right. Ebola, it's one virus or Zika, right. but it's right. not. Every time a virus invades our species or causes a disease, it's literally a whole swarm of like a family tree, like an invading horde, right. like, like Genghis Khan and all his troops coming in. It's not just like one dude. Um, and they, so if you get sick, you gotta know like which of Genghis Khan's fleet has got you. And usually yeah. it doesn't make a difference if you're in the hospital with COVID, it's COVID. You got SARS-CoV-2. We aren't always that concerned about what variant you have. Um, however, certain variants are because of the mutations they have. Some of the mutations are just a fingerprint that tells you, you know, what part of the family tree the virus is in, but other mutations give the virus, I don't want to say superpowers, but differences. Right. Like right. measurable differences. Like we now know from like like three paper, three publications that are peer reviewed that B117, the virus that was first detected in the UK, which I will remind everyone is, is very, very sensitive to all the vaccines that have rolled out. So if you've taken a vaccine and you see these headlines about B117 taking over, you could rest really well assured that you will not die from B117. You probably won't even test positive for it if you got an mRNA vaccine or if you got the J&J &J vaccine. Yeah, so, that's amazing. So that's really, vaccines are amazing. But if you haven't yet gotten a vaccine, it's especially important. And if you want to protect your community, it's especially important to know that B117 has a 50% or higher rate of death if you end up in the hospital with it. And it is about, um, and maybe it's a 60% higher rate of death. I, I, I saw 64, it's, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a range. They always give you a range of right. confidence in, interval. Yeah, that's they, a lot. Well, it's like, that, yeah, that's it's, huge. To, to it, get the it's, yeah, it's not that huge. I mean, yeah. it's not like a ten. It's not like a zombie movie huge where right, right, right. Is like killing ten people where it used to kill one. It right. means that like out of a thousand people, where one would die before, one point six dies. So right, right. Yeah, down, I think I saw down, the. Or, or I, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting the ratio, but um, it, but it, it's, like it's a, a different increase. disease, right? Than the, at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, it's definitely looks like it as a signal of being more dangerous. Um, and then the other thing is it's more transmissible. So when I say that the contact tracing at the beginning of the pandemic that was done in like really in countries where people do like 
are very organized and diligent about it. Like, you know, they really track everyone with cell phones and stuff like Asia or certain European countries where they can go back and be like, okay, they'll interview someone and, and they'll get very high levels of cooperation that you wouldn't necessarily get in the United States. But like maybe somewhere in like in Germany, people who are interviewed are like, hey, you got sick. Can you please share with us? Because they trust their healthcare system more. I'm not saying it's universal. There may be some people mm -hmm. who Germany don't trust the government, but by and large, they're very cooperative with their like local health department because they'll be like, hey, you know, you tested positive. Can you please tell us uh, who you had contact with in the last two weeks? And they'll be like, yeah, you know, I was with my cousin. We had, you know, we had some people over for brunch and uh, there were three people and it was this person, this person, this person. And I went to work that day and I work in a cubicle and the people near me are this person, this person, this person. And they go and interview all those people and they test all those people. And from doing hundreds of those kind of tracing uh, studies, they were able to figure out that it took 10 to 15 minutes of close indoor spread because they found out like, hey, I played baseball with these people outdoors or, you know, I went to my volleyball meet and those contacts never tested positive, but the people who were indoors did. So okay. now with B117, there's a question mark because we know it's 50% more transmissible, but maybe the 10 to 15 minutes indoors has changed to five or three. You know, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that, but it's still yeah. likely, I mean, the differences are not a thousand fold or a hundred fold or even tenfold. You're talking about a 60% difference. That's, it's significant, but it's not, changing the it's not a game changer in terms of transmission i doubt that b117 is transmitting outdoors a bazillion times better than the original virus but i would be more concerned about it transmitting more easily indoors that doesn't mean that it can now drill a hole in your mask and get in that's not right right right, right. It, doesn't, yeah. it, it cannot change gravity you know it still has to follow the basic rules of biology and rational thought I think it helps anyone understand these things to put your brain at the scale of a virus. Think like a virus would. You know, these aren't that mystical. They have to follow rules. You can think about like the rules that you have to follow every day to like do your thing. Like you, ha you have to cross a bridge, you stop at a toll booth, you know, you have to pay a fee. Like viruses have little boundaries that they have to worry about too, or they don't think, you know, they're conscious, but they still have right. to cross certain boundaries to do their business. And they're subjected to rules, regulations, um, you know, not legal ones from governments, but ones of biology and nature and physics. Right. And if you know a few of those things, it's very empowering as an individual to be like, okay, this is when I should be wearing a mask and this is what I shouldn't, or this is when I really need to be, you know? So figure out where to spend your mental energy protecting yourself. Don't wear a mask. If you're sick of wearing a mask, maybe right. focus on wearing a mask where it matters. Instead of just being like, oh, I'm going to put mask on like 5% of the time today because I'm tired of masks. Well, why don't you worry about wearing a mask indoors when you go to like uh, a crowded place, like you, you have to get in line somewhere indoors to pay a bill or go grocery shopping or whatever in a crowded grocery store. Hey, wear, wear a mask. That's when it's going to help you. Now, is it going to be important to wear a mask with the people who you live with in your house? Probably not. Like, you know, that's, that's impractical. So, um, so you mentioned B117, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's other variants, um, like there's one in, in Brazil, there's one in, in South Africa. Um, in the United States, there's also, you know, one in New York. Um, that is, um, I, I don't know if it's a very variant of, of interest or concern right now. Um, can, can you give a little bit more of the lay of the land? On, yeah, so, you know, so those are the more concerning ones. Uh, from the vaccine or immune escape standpoint. B117 is the most concerning one from, it's like, you know, it's like the sprinter that can win every race. Uh, the other two maybe have, there's some data that says they, they have increased transmission, but what concerns me about them is that they're able to infect people who have already recovered from COVID. Hmm. And depending on what vaccine that someone has gotten, they may even be able to infect vaccinated people. Most of the vaccines in the United States that have been emergency approved, EUA, as they call it, or EUA approved um, by the FDA, they all provide very good protection against any of these variants when it comes to hospitalization or death. And that's a really important nuance that is lost in most of the headlines or on Twitter or social media. People are like, oh my gosh, 
I saw some really famous physician with like 200,000 followers saying, oh, the one dose of BioNTech Pfizer is useless. That's just wrong. I mean, that, that vaccine is probably well above 95% likely to save your life if you had it two weeks before you were infected with any of the variants. You take the scariest variant out there. Um, but the thing about this, this, the variant B1351, which was discovered in South Africa by Tulio de Oliveira and um, someone named uh, Hagali, who's a, a, a very prominent uh, woman researcher in South Africa, who's the first author of that study. Um, and there was another group in Brazil that discovered something called P1 and, P2, and P2. Um, and Naveka is the first author of that study, I think. And there's some other people who've worked on it there. But these scientists in other countries have found these variants that are able to, what that happened is they emerged in communities where people don't have the luxury perhaps of social distancing. If you're a poorer person and live with 1500 people in a crowded house and, and dad drives a bus and mom works at a grocery store, you may not have the luxury of socially distancing even if you got those messages, like you gotta put food on the table for your kids. So right. those communities got slammed by the first wave of the pandemic and the virus is just like, it's like a water leak in a roof. It's gonna find a way down through the floor. Like it figures out when there's an uncontrolled pandemic and people are becoming immune naturally, the ones who didn't end up dead, who recovered from COVID, they make neutralizing antibodies, which put up like a kind of a fence or a guard post. Right. So the virus finds ways through. And if the person already recovered, they're probably safe almost every time from ending up in the hospital or dead but the virus might infect their upper respiratory tract. Instead of making pneumonia, it may right. get in their mouth and nose. And then it's using them to bounce through the population until it finds someone who's oh, never been vaccinated and never been infected. And that person ends up in the hospital. Oh, so the, okay. concern, the yeah. concern with these immune escape variants with B117 is not really in that category, even though it can escape certain monoclonal antibodies. The vaccine, list, the, the antibodies you get from the vaccines totally crush, crush it. It cannot, it cannot take it. B117 is a sitting duck for all the major vaccines, which is another reason to get vaccinated quick. But these other ones, they're going to spread around and they might even infect you a little tiny bit if you've been vaccinated. But it's unlikely if you've been vaccinated that it's going to be able to spread from you to someone else. But the, the risk is not zero. It's small. And biology is about, all about the small things growing. Yeah. Like if I was to spray my lawn with some kind of weed killer that kills almost all weeds, but lets grass grow for months, it'll work. All of a sudden there'll be like a couple patches of dandelions that start sprouting up and they just don't really care about the weed killer that much anymore. That's called selection. That's what Darwin was talking about. And viruses are no different. They're gonna, if there's a large amount of variation and mutations, you're gonna get selection for the ones that happen to be lucky enough to get past the defenses and they're going to start growing first it'll just be a little bit but the ones that make it will get rewarded and the ones that don't aren't on the aren't on the bulletin board anymore they're gone they're extinct so it's you know there's a saying in biology you have to run as fast as you can just to stand still that's called the red queen hypothesis and viruses are doing it humans are doing it every species that are alive is trying to just exist and it doesn't make them evil or good or bad or anything. It just makes them life. And the, right. the neat thing about viruses is they're like us and they're like insects or like plants. We're all one big family tree. And if you understand them that way, it makes it less scary. Um, you touched on, um, on the vaccine um, and, um, um, and I wanna to touch on efficacy, right? Cause there's this idea of efficacy and I think uh, it's not well understood right? Um, so, you know, some vaccines are 95%, other ones are in the 80s or 50s. Like, like wh what does it mean? Right? Like, what does efficacy mean uh, for a vaccine? So when you do a pharmaceutical drug trial or a vaccine trial, you don't get to come up with what you're going to call efficacy after you do the trial. You have to upfront tell the regulator, regulators, which are the FDA usually, um, if you're in the United States, hey, I'm gonna do a drug study. I'm registering with the government. It's gonna be done transparently because that's the only way that flies. And efficacy is gonna be defined by, I'm gonna swab the patients and we're gonna like record on, on a phone app if they've been sick or had a cold. 
and we're going to swab them with regularity and anytime they have a cold or anything to figure out if they've caught coronavirus after they've gotten the vaccine or after they've gotten a fake version of the vaccine called placebo because that's how you do a controlled experiment right so um, all these vaccines have numbers for efficacy that are actually underselling their success, luckily for us, right. because efficacy is defined by detectable infection instead of protection from death or hospitalization. So the J&J vaccine, for instance, has been tested in South Africa in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic when B1351, which can escape all these antibodies, um, was prevalent. Like it's the overwhelmingly dominant strain or variant there. And the vaccine didn't hit it out of the park when it comes to efficacy. I think it had 80 something or high 70% efficacy at preventing like detectable infection in the nose and the upper respiratory tract. But okay. it was uh, basically 100% effective at preventing death and hospitalization. So that is really reassuring because if you can turn COVID-19 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, which we call SARS-CoV-2, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two, into the common cold. You know, does anyone, is anyone that freaked out about the common cold? I don't think so. Okay. There's a bunch of coronaviruses that if we didn't have antibodies to them, maybe they'd be just as bad as, SARS, as, as COVID-19. The thing is they've been in our species for hundred years, 200 years, and we all catch them as kids and we have immune, we have immunity to them naturally. So, I mean, some people would argue with my interpretation there and say, we should really, really be scared. But when I talk to people who study coronaviruses professionally for 20 years, and I'm not one of those people, mm -hmm. I study herpes viruses normally, I'm not a coronavirus guy. Um, but when I talk to people who really study coronaviruses, they say this, this coronavirus isn't even all that scary compared to other coronaviruses they've studied, like ones that infect mice and ones that infect other species that are like so, so, so amazing at overtaking the cell and like mm -hmm. hot wiring the innate immune system. Cause you have two levels of immunity. You have one something called innate immunity or intrinsic immunity, which is like, it's there even before you have antibodies or T cells. It's there before a vaccine or a natural infection educates your special cells to like specifically safeguard against them. And then you have your adaptive immunity, which is T cells and B cells making antibodies and specific cytotoxic responses and CD4 responses that, again, recognize a specific threat and, and respond appropriately. So vaccines take, take advantage of the second group, the adaptive side, but they are telling me, hey, these other coronaviruses are much scarier in terms of their ability to like blunt what we call the interferon response or the innate immune system. So this is like a middle of the road coronavirus, according to them. And what they say is so scary about it and the reason it can cause pneumonia is mm -hmm. that our bodies have never seen anything like it before anagenically. Right. And so the vaccine, the, the superpower of the vaccine is to educate us about it, school us about it before it comes in. So we have a defense. And that really does seem to disarm the worst consequences for almost everyone. Yeah, um, there's so many areas to dive into here. Um, let's dive into, um, just to help people um, understand, um, part of the process for the vaccine development and, and the safety involved um, because this vaccine was, um, you know, made public um, in record time, right? Um, can you share, um, you know, what was done differently during the development of, of this vaccine process in order to, um, uh, you know, to, sh to show confidence um, that it is ready uh, for the public? No, that's a really, really great question. There's a lot of distrust out there because the vaccine was approved on a, even on an emergency basis and went through all these trials in record time. So they cut a lot of red tape and the red tape is really there to protect us, right? They, they want to make sure a vaccine's safe before they roll it out. But, you know, if you, have a, if you have someone who's dying of cancer and you have a new cancer drug and every other cancer drug has failed, should there be a compassionate use of this cancer drug? And uh, there are ways to give experimental cancer drugs to people who are, have, are out of options. And we know they're gonna die otherwise. And there's an analogy here to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what's the cost of not accelerating the development of vaccine strategies that we know work really well to prevent like cat coronavirus diseases and, and you know, there are coronaviruses that make cats 
sick, for instance, that in, in cows like die that we have vaccines against that work. And humans, sadly, we're not all that different from a cat or a cow when it comes to our immune system. So biologists know what strategies are safe and work and which have already been tested sometimes in monkeys against the first coronavirus. So we already knew strategies that were likely to work. And the other thing is like, you know, one funny thing that turned out to be a tragedy and lucky at the same time was that the pandemic was so poorly controlled. So mm -hmm. a lot of people died unnecessarily, right. but because there was so much virus circulating when Pfizer, uh, Moderna, uh, Pfizer and BioNTech is the same vaccine. And then Moderna is like a related vaccine. It's almost identical. And then you had the J&J &J vaccine, you had Sputnik vaccine from Russia, which is almost identical in strategy to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, you have Sinopharma's vaccine from China, which is inactivated particles. All these vaccines were getting tried. And luckily and unluckily at the same time, there was so much virus in circulation that the people who happened to be getting immunized, we were able to see how well the vaccines worked because everyone around them was catching COVID. Right. Who didn't get the vaccine, you could see the graphs, you can pull them up, they're like striking. People who didn't get the vaccine, the curve goes, and the people who did, it's like, and so like you get to about 12 days post vaccine and the people who got the vaccine, this finger right here. Right. And the people who, who didn't, COVID rates. Yeah. And so you saw this, the same curve happened for Moderna and Pfizer, you know, and, the, and then similar things played out in other countries that were trying different vaccines. And so that's why it made so much sense to give that emergency authorization because the data was so strong that these weren't just good vaccines, they were phenomenal vaccines. And sadly enough, because again, a lot of different governments, not just ours, failed to control the coronavirus pandemic. We had what you had was, I mean, I'd, I'd say it was almost unethical if it, was, it had been planned that way. It was a human challenge study. You know, we had an uncontrolled pandemic and you got to see very clearly the signal of protection was so strong. And if we didn't have the uncontrolled pandemic, it'd be harder to say with certainty that the vaccines are so effective. But now we know they are. I see, so right. There's some people, um, when people have conversations of vaccines, uh, some people say they want to wait, right? They want to see what happens, right? Um, you know, they, um, is, is there, um, you know, um, what, what would your response be to that? You know, for them to say, oh, I want to wait a year. I want to wait, you know. I think years. every person, you know, has their autonomy and right to make their own decision. You really have to respect that. At yeah. the same time, like, you know, you get people on Twitter telling you to do some research or something, and they're talking to like a researcher. Like, and it's just like, okay, <laughs> what do you mean by your own researcher? Like, you're going to go select for things on the web that agree with what you already agree with? Like, that's not research. Research is trying, if you're doing science and you really care about the truth, you mm -hmm. should be trying to disprove your favorite idea. That's how science mm -hmm. works. So mm -hmm. if you think the vaccine's a bad idea, you should right. be looking at all the data that says the opposite of what you think and try to put all that data in front of yourself. Research right. is not going to websites that agree with what you already think is true. That's not research. That's called confirmation bias. And that's driving a lot of really bad decisions. And also a bunch of snake oil salesmen are selling people tragically who don't know much science. And they're not bad people. They, they, they're trying to critically think. They're trying to amass information. But, you know... Uh, they're being sold like artificial supplements, homeopathy, garbage, basically. It's not right. going to protect right. them. And they're being told things like, hey, if you're healthy and have a good immune system and lift weights and eat a healthy diet, the coronavirus isn't a threat to you. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but we had a, a 40 something year old congressman who just got elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Louisiana, Luke Letlow, here in Shreveport, died, you know, a few miles away from me in the hospital here. And he was yeah. medevaced in from Monroe. Um, because they couldn't save his life. He was well-fed. He was healthy. He's a dad. Yeah. And he was in his 40s. And he wasn't malnourished. He wasn't out of shape. He wasn't high risk by anything on paper. But you just don't know. If you're playing Russian roulette if you get this virus. And the other thing is, even if you don't die from it, even if you don't get very sick, if you aren't vaccinated, you could be very likely spreading, to, spreading the virus to someone else who spreads it to someone else who ends up spreading it into a nursing home or a prison or some place where people don't have the luxury of socially distancing. So you could be inadvertently guilty of causing someone else's death because you oh, wanted wow. to wait a year. Right. 
And, um, you know, and to your point earlier about B117, uh, it being more severe, um, it, it doesn't, uh, there, there's some, um, you know, information coming out of places like Minnesota that, you know, it's, they're having outbreaks amongst younger demographics, right? And mm -hmm. so it, I don't know if you, you've seen data on showing, you know, has severity increased for the younger demographics as well? Are we still waiting for that? Do we not know? Well, yeah, that's a really cool question. And I'm not the world expert on that. So I'll be the first to say, but I have seen a lot of reports coming across my Twitter feed from you know top experts that say the B117 seems to be infecting children better than the original virus. And that makes a lot of sense biologically because it seems to bind the receptors more tightly. It seems more inherently infectious. So that's you know something sh people should watch out for and take, uh, take close attention to. Um, the other thing that's interesting and a little bit, you know, I don't want to say scary, but something, again, concerning is the right word. Um, we now know that these variants like P1 that was found in Brazil and B1.351, which was found in South Africa, it used to be that if you wanted to study SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 in the lab, and, and you want, like a lot of biologists like to study stuff in mice because the genetic systems are so well worked out and they're like a, you know, wh whatever you feel about whether animal experiments are ethical or not, people like to study disease in mice as a, as a model for a whole bunch of things with human disease. The original coronavirus couldn't infect mice. The ones that, B, that B1351 mutation and the P1 mutations now the spike allows the virus to enter mice without having to adapt it or change it in any way. That tells you there's like a shift in the biology of the virus in terms of its ability to infect any kind of mammal, mammal cell. And so that makes it even less surprising to me that B117 okay. might be able to infect children better than the original virus from 2019 Wuhan, China. Remember these coronaviruses are pretty flexible about what mammal species they'll infect. That's why, they're pan that's why they're a pandemic concern, just like influenza is. These viruses are always brewing up in nature in bats. Um, for, for influenza, it's like birds and pigs, and they spill over into people after shuffling their genomes every year for flu. And then for, for bats, they're recombining with other coronaviruses and bat caves and stuff, and they spill into people. And they're just so um, flexible about their host range. And, and when they spill into people, it's always a little bit of a risk. And so that, you know, the story of how the same mutations that happened in Brazil and South Africa or were detected there, I should say, that allowed the virus to escape the antibody protection against the first wave viruses, also serendipitously or luckily for the virus, unluckily for us, now allow the virus to infect species it couldn't infect before, like mice. Yeah, it shouldn't surprise us that now the virus is effect is behaving differently in children because those are the same species as us, right? All right. So, so let's let's touch on. Uh, well, and I know you have to leave in about uh, a few minutes, so mm -hmm. um, I just want to check in with you on time. Okay, sure. Let me check my calendar real quick. Okay. I think I told my next commitment that I'd be I might be five minutes late, but yeah. So yeah, I got to leave in about eight minutes. Okay. So. Um, all right, so, so let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about herd immunity, okay. right? So we're talking about you know um, the variants. We're talking about um, vaccines, right? And then and then there's this idea of herd immunity, right? And um, you know it it looks like um, <clears throat> excuse me um, it looks like in the United States, um, you know we're trying to get a herd immunity. That's the idea everywhere, right? Um, with with the vaccines. Um, and uh, one, why is that important? Two, what happens if we don't reach it, right? And, and also what happens if we reach in the United States um, and, and, and not the rest of the world? All right, that's, that, that's herd immunity, I think has gotten more complicated even than the people who are talking about it at the beginning of the pandemic. So for a virus like measles, um, where the vaccines, or at least the original ones, so effective, um, herd immunity that, that you get from vaccination really prevents the virus from moving around and having any space evolutionarily to change and adapt. So um, the, the original idea of herd immunity is because the virus has to hop from person to person from person, you know, it's like you're protected as part of the herd from being susceptible because it cannot get to you as an individual because it would have to get through 
person A, person B, person C, person D, and let's say you're person F or G or H, it can't get to you if person A, B, and C are immune. Um, so as soon as you get a certain percentage of people immune, the virus is not effectively transmitting. Now we do know that the mRNA vaccines, and I think the data is still being analyzed on J&J because that just got a, you know, emergency approved a little more recently, but we expect that that one will be very successful too. The vaccines seem to really reduce, not to zero, but nearly to zero, the ability of the virus to spread from one person to another, even with variants. So that's a good thing. But we do know at the same time that the vaccines are not 100% perfect at preventing infection, even if they prevent disease. So the concern that I have as a biologist is that maybe to varying degrees, these viruses are penetrating herd immunity as far as infection, even if they are, um, even if the vaccines are preventing disease. Um, and then to your other question, well, what about the rest of the world? And that's a really yeah. important, that's, a, that's probably the most important question you've asked. Because I think Americans need to contact their Congress people because it's really a humanitarian disaster that we have not, as a wealthy country, done everything we can to make sure that poorer countries, lower middle income countries, less politically powerful countries have the vaccine. Because we really should be doing that it's in our interest economically. If the pandemic is uncontrolled in Africa and poorer countries in Asia and South America and Brazil, then that means new virus variants are gonna keep percolating up that escape the vaccines, that escape immunity and they'll hit the United States. Plus these countries are our trading partners. We sell them things and they sell us things to make our phones, to have delicious fruit in the supermarket, you name it, um, everything. So if, if the rest of the world doesn't control the pandemic because they don't have the vaccines. And I've heard in a lot of African countries, even health workers, people in hospitals treating COVID-19 patients don't have access to vaccines yet. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, getting everyone Im immunized here and that's great. And I get that it's politically popular to take care of your own first, but I think it's ethically not a sustainable answer if the countries with the most wealth are not doing everything they can to rev up vaccine production um, here abroad and distribution to countries that don't have it yet. Because I don't care who your president is, where you happen to be born, as a human being, you have the same, I think, right to be healthy and protected from this disease as anyone else. Yeah, yeah I, thank you, Jeremy. That's such a great message. And um, in, in the last few minutes, um, uh, do you want to close out with, with any last thoughts? Yeah, the last thought I would have is I think there's a really important conversation that's also not happening that's related to the thing I told you about with like making sure that the whole world is protected is we're not going to go back to a time when we aren't sequencing viruses all the time. Uh, before the pandemic, sequencing of viruses was treated like research. So you have the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease. You have the Center for Disease Control. And there's been a pattern of centralization of information. So you saw that the previous president, Donald Trump, was able to basically slow down the CDC from testing because he didn't want the cases to go up officially. And you could imagine that if he was in charge of sequencing, he'd say, slow down the sequencing. We don't want to find about variants. Sequencing creates variants. You can never again allow independent communities like states, cities, towns to be at the mercy of the central federal government to tell them whether there's a, a threat in their neighborhood. If there's someone in your neighborhood breaking into houses, you don't have to wait till the White House tells you that there's a thief in your, or a murderer or a rapist in your neighborhood. Why should you have to wait to find out whether there's a new virus in your neighborhood? And so how do you encourage, and the, another problem that's related to the same thing is, how do you encourage scientists who sequence viruses to share their data in real time? We do this with coronavirus only because there's something called GISAID, G-I-S-A-I-D.org. And GISAID empowers both Americans um, in rich states and poor states like Louisiana, where I am, and also people in lower and middle income countries like Brazil, or even countries that we don't get along with like Iran, um, to, and, and like Brazil, we aren't always like agreeing with Brazil or Russia, we all these countries upload their data to GISAID on the coronavirus or on flu. And if there's Ebola on Ebola, so why do they do it? The reason they do it and they do it right away 
is because of the data use agreement that says the people uploading the data own the data, even though they're sharing it in real time. So if I'm a scientist and I wanna publish on someone else's work, I'm encouraged very strongly and transparently, everyone can see who's seeing whoever else's data. So if right. I see someone else's data and I use their data and I publish a fancy paper in nature and get a big grant from it, and I didn't acknowledge them, you know, I violated the DUA and I get locked out of the database and everyone knows and they can call me out on it. Like, hey, you used 400,000 of my sequences in your work and yeah. you only contributed 10, yet you got a big paper. You didn't even reach out to us. What's up with that? We have a record of it. It's all recorded. So I can't publish someone else's data. It's just like recording a, a jazz music or a hip hop song. Why would you do that work and share it to be played on the radio if like your daughter, when she goes into the cafe and hears your song playing, right. doesn't get to know that, hey, that's her daddy's song that's playing right, exactly, or, yeah. or her mom's song, you know, like yeah. why, why should you be able to, you, you know, so you have to think about the incentives to share in real time. I think that comes back to community ownership. So the CDC right now, unfortunately is pushing a model for centralizing data. And I think everyone in their communities, whether it's an Indian, a Native American reservation or a city or a, a community that's not even really involved in science, the sequences that come out of like a virus that gives you a fever are worth money. And right now Quest, LabCorp, Helix, Illumina are getting giant contracts paid for by your federal tax dollars, your grandkids' taxes really, because it's like budget deficits, right? right. Right. That's going to be funding this. And if we don't speak up, it's not going to be done right. we got to make sure that people are protected in their ownership rights of the sequences they generate of even diseases that make them sick. I know it's not their DNA or RNA. It's not your genome, but even yeah. the stuff that makes you sick, you should own it. You should have a stake in it. And, you know, there should be some ownership left in the communities, the, the lion's share of it, really, because the sequencing machines and the geeky scientists like me, that's not the special thing. The thing that's essential is that the data is flowing from the communities. People have to be trusting the people right. that are giving them the samples. And to have people saying, oh, we're gonna sequence all the samples that come in from drugstores or hospitals and not even tell them that that's what we're doing with it. That's shady. Stuff should be transparent and communities need to know that this is happening because it protects us all if there's more data. And the way to get more data is to make people feel like they're in charge and they own it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love that idea of, of community ownership and, and the incentives have to be right, you know, um, right. in, in order for it to be accurate and for people to keep doing the work. Um, so, um, Jeremy, um, I appreciate your time so much. Um, we're sharing this out live. Uh, please um, follow Jeremy uh, on Twitter um, at microfilter. Micro, um, micro. Oh, oh, macro. Sorry. <laughs> Macro, macro leader. I just did a joke because in, in science, you're often pipetting micro leaders, which means one. <laughs> leader. right. And so that one wasn't available. So I was like, I'll flip it around and call it a macro leader, which is like a Dr. Seuss nonsense. Um, and I'm also at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in Shreveport. Uh, the people in charge don't like me to be called LSU because LSU is like the big football team down in Baton Rouge, totally different campus. Right. But thank you okay. for sharing your platform with me around these important issues, Joaquin. I really appreciate it. Of course, of course. And thank you for your time. And uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel um, and we'll be sending out more updates on this um, and be sh we'll be sharing uh, clips of this as well. Um, and please share it with your community. We want you to be empowered. We want you to keep yourself your families and your community safe. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joaquin. Have, have a good Thanks, have a good afternoon. Bye bye.